section within this series of studies on worship. Uh, we looked at the importance of worship, at least to some degree, in our study last week. Tonight we want to look at the, the object of our worship. And then uh, beginning next week, Lord willing, we'll begin our summer series. And so we will uh, leave off this study, at least for the time being. And uh, when we come back to it, nobody knows. But we'll get back to it eventually, somewhere along the way. As we've noted in the outline, God has always expected and required worship. We mentioned in our study last week, uh, the first time the word worship itself is used is found where? Can't hear you, Robert. All right, uh, Genesis chapter 22. <clears throat> when Abraham was about to go and offer in compliance with God's command, his son, he said that he and the lad would go yonder and worship. Now, that's the first time the word is used. But that's not the first time that worship was offered. Uh, you go back to Genesis chapter 4, and we mentioned that in connection with our study last week, the offering of the sacrifices by Cain and Abel, and according to Hebrews 11, the Hebrews writer said, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice. By faith suggests what to us? They had instruction. God had, had told them what He expected of them. <clears throat> and that has always been the case. Whether we're looking during the patriarchal dispensation or coming on down to the mosaical dispensation or now living in the Christian dispensation, when it comes to worship, God has always specified what He will accept and expects as worship. It's not left up to us to decide what we want to offer in worship. It is what God has specified. It's almost in some cases <clears throat> as if people have the idea we can offer what we want to offer, what pleases us, what satisfies us, and God will automatically accept it. But that's not the way it works. And there are numerous examples in that regard. In John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24, another passage that we used by way of introduction to last week's lesson, the hours come and now is when the true worshiper shall worship God how? <clears throat> Spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is seeking people who will worship Him in spirit, which is what? What's another word there? <clears throat> huh? Attitude, disposition. So it does matter as far as our attitude relative to worship is concerned. And again, we talked about that in some detail last week. But he seeks those to worship him in spirit of the right attitude, right disposition, and truth. So truth reveals to us how God wants to be worshipped. <clears throat> God has let it be known that he has prescribed what he wants, and everything else <clears throat> is going to be rejected. You may recall in Matthew chapter 15, when Jesus said, <clears throat> In vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. And so that simply says to us that wherever the doctrines of men are being taught that worship is in vain under those circumstances. <clears throat> so worship and doctrine obviously go hand in hand. Now there are two sections that I want us to look at that are actually not in your outline. Go back to 1 Kings chapter 18 for a moment, and this will be uh, a familiar section to you. But I want us to <clears throat> think for a moment until we have some understanding and appreciation 
of God, then we're not going to have a great deal of appreciation for our worship to God. In 1 Kings chapter 18, you have the story of Elijah as he uh, comes to face to face with the people of God, and they were involved in this situation. Uh, if you um, <clears throat> go back to verse 18, and it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah, the prophet, came near and said, Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Now what has taken place in this regard? God's people have forsaken God. They are now attempting to I guess you could say divide their time between attention to the Almighty God and to other gods, specifically, in this case, what other god? Baal. <clears throat> and so you'll notice, uh, in continuing on in that section, verse 37, Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell, and consumed the burnt sacrifice, and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their face, and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Now, hopefully you remember the background of this. Elijah had come to these people and said, <clears throat> How long halt ye between two opinions? How long is it going to take you to decide who God is? If it's Baal, then serve Him. If it's God, then serve Him. But you can't have it both ways. You can't have divided allegiance. What was it Jesus said in Matthew 7, <clears throat> I believe beginning about verse uh, 24, no man can serve two masters. Can't have it both ways. And so Elijah's basically saying to these people, you need to make up your mind who it is that you're going to serve. You're going to serve Baal, you're going to serve God. But now which one is really God? That's the question here. And so he <clears throat> allowed the uh, people who wanted, to, or the prophets of Baal at least, to have the first opportunity to call upon their God, Baal. They prepared the sacrifice, they prepared the altar, just as uh, they had been instructed to do. And uh, they began to call upon Baal. What happened? Nothing. <clears throat> Nothing. Then what did they do? Got a little louder, got a little more boisterous began to cut themselves, even got a little bit of encouragement from Elijah, hollered a little louder, maybe he's taking a nap or off checking on somebody else, uh, actually poking fun at them in that regard, because those kinds of things could never be said of God. When can you approach the throne of God and he's attending to somebody else's needs and doesn't hear you. Doesn't happen, does it? Doesn't happen that way. And so throughout the course of the day, that was the process to no avail. But then the section that we just read is where Elijah and those who helped him had, had basically rebuilt the altar, uh, made preparation to call upon God, and uh, God responded in the way that uh, we read here just a minute ago. The fire came down out of heaven, consumed the sacrifice, uh, the wood, the stones, the dust, licked up the water that was in the trench. Could there be any doubt at this point who is God? Obviously not. And so the people recognize that. This is God. 
This is the God that we're talking about tonight, who is the object of our worship, who can prove himself in the face of any opposition to be God. There has never been nor ever will be any opposition that can prove itself stronger than the Almighty. Is Satan powerful? You better believe he is. Look how many people he's persuaded to serve him. Give you some idea of just how powerful and influential he is. But yet he's no match for God. And so when we begin to think about who is this God? When we talk about the object of our worship, God is going to be the ultimate answer to that question. Who is the object? God is the object. Who is this God? Well, you look back here, this particular section, and you'll find out who that God is. Now, you could probably think of numerous examples in the Old Testament to give testimony to exactly who God is. You might think, for example, of the flood. Who brought that about? God, as a result of the sins of the people. Who brought the people of Israel out of Egyptian bondage? Who parted the waters of the Red Sea? Who allowed them to walk across on dry ground? Who brought the waters back together and drowned the Egyptian army? God. He was in control of all of that. Yes, He was using human instrumentality, but it was the power of God that brought all of that about. So you might think of any number of examples. What about the walls coming down around the city of Jericho? Uh, if you've ever studied anything about the, the um, mass of wall that was actually there, uh, I forget the exact figures, but, but you could drive several chariots side by side around on top of that wall. It was so wide somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 feet high. Pretty good wall, wouldn't you say? And all those people had to do was march around it how many times? <clears throat> how many times? Thank you. Not seven. Thirteen times. Because they went around seven times on that seventh day, didn't they not? All right. <clears throat> and then when they had gone around it, shouted with a great shout, whatever, what happened to those walls? A little bit of a crack here and there. No. I believe if you'll go back and check your story, the Bible says that every man was able to walk straight way into the city. So it wasn't some little opening somewhere where everybody had to go all the way around and go through that one little opening. The Bible says that every man went straight way in before him into the city. Now how devastating is that to that size walk? The walking around was able to do that. Enough vibration was caused by that army of God's people walking around that city 13 times did that? No. God did that. Now in the New Testament, look at Acts chapter 17 for a moment. And again, this is nothing uh, new to us. But it helps us to realize when we talk about God being the object of our worship, <clears throat> exactly what we're dealing with in this regard. Uh, Paul was the main character, if you please. We're going to begin in verse 16 of this chapter. He was waiting at Athens for others to join him there. The Bible said his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. So here was the city that was not devoted to God, but devoted to idols. That bothered Paul. That brought a reaction from Paul. He disputed in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout person in the market daily with them that met with him. Then um, you can read on down through there. Drop down to verse 22. Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill. And he said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with the inscription to the unknown God 
whom therefore ye ignorantly worship him, declare I unto you. Now they were worshiping all of these idols. Why did they have an altar with this inscription to the unknown God? Well, there have been a variety of answers given to that question. Some would suggest that they had so many gods, they just wanted to make sure that they didn't overlook one, so they erected an altar of this nature. Others have suggested that uh, possibly there were those within the city that actually realized that then maybe there really was another God. I don't know what the exact explanation is. It doesn't really matter. But Paul took this occasion, and he said, That God that you are ignorantly worshiping, Him declare I unto you. Why didn't he declare unto them some of these other gods that they were worshiping? I mean, we're told that there were some 30,000 gods that were being worshiped in that city. Why didn't he turn his attention to one of them? Because they were not the true God, and Paul knew it. And he wanted them to understand the distinction between the God of heaven that they should be worshiping and the other gods whom they were giving worship as well. And so he spoke to them about this God. Who is this God that they were ignorantly worshiping? Well, he gives, I think, one of the, probably as good of a lesson as you could ever find on God in this very context. Where does he begin? Who is this God? He's the Creator. Who is he? He's the one that made all of this that we see around us. The world and all that in it is. He created it. Power? Oh, yeah. Matter of fact, God's power is so great that there's no amount of accumulative wisdom among men to begin to fathom the power of God. He created this world. That's where Paul starts in that regard. Now, you'll notice... In verse 23, or 25 rather, <clears throat> neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, see that he giveth to all life and breath and all things. So obviously, Paul is saying at this point, he is in fact the object of worship. He is the only one who is worthy of that honor and glory and praise and respect that is incorporated in that word worship. He's the one. You'll notice in verse 26 that he has placed himself, he's made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on the face of the earth. That would suggest that he's a God of peace he made this world, and then he uh, placed man upon it. And he wants us to dwell here together in that regard. You'll notice in verse um, 28, it is in him that we live and move and have our being. He is the one who is the sustainer of life. So he's the creator. He's the object of worship. He's the author of peace. He's the sustainer of life. He is the one who is deserving of our worship. But he doesn't stop there. In verse 10, he says, The times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. God is a lawgiver. He's the one who's given a law by which we are to live our lives. What law did Baal give? Baal never gave a law. His followers had certain rites and rituals that, that they demanded of, of Baal's followers, but Baal didn't give the law. Because Baal is nothing but an idol. No other God has ever given a law except the true and living God. He wants us to live by that law. He is the source of judgment, verse 31. He's the one before whom we're going to ultimately stand 
to give account of our lives. That makes it important, doesn't it? That we understand, number one, that He is the object of our worship, and number two, He is the one who has every right, has the authority to tell us how He is to be worshipped. We can't just pick and choose. Ways that we want to offer worship to God. He has specified how we are to give that honor and glory and praise to Him in that regard. Now you'll see as you read through verses 32, 33, and 34 that you had a general reaction much as we have today when we present to the world God. Some people didn't want to hear it, didn't hear it. Some mocked, according to verse 32. Others said, we'll hear thee again on this matter. Other certain men clave unto him and believe. So that's pretty much the reaction when you preach God today, isn't it? Some people just mock you, they'll scoff at you, they'll ridicule you. Others will say, well, you know, maybe there's something to this. Maybe we ought to talk about it more later. It's interesting how... Different people observe different comments in the Scripture. When you read uh, various commentators, uh, others said, we will hear thee again on this matter. Some interpret that as procrastination. Uh, They're just putting it off. Personally, I don't subscribe to that idea. I think they were were at least to some degree interested in what Paul had said and wanted to hear more about it. And then there were others who believed it when it was preached. That's the God that we're talking about when we talk about the object of our worship. And until we can understand and appreciate something about God, then we'll never understand and appreciate what worship is all about. When we worship God, the creator of this world, in the way that He has specified that we worship Him, that's going to be the next several lessons through this series once we get back to it. It's not something that we do lightly. It's not something that we should do without some forethought. It's not something that we can do without preparation. That's actually the next lesson once we get back to this study. That's why I'm concerned at the attitude that it often exists and the atmosphere that often exists when we assemble together to worship God. Yes, I realize that there is to be fellowship. I realize that through our coming together we do encourage one another. But I wonder sometimes if our minds can go from daily activity one minute to a proper attitude and worship to God the next. And oftentimes it comes to that even more quickly. I mean, you just listen to the buzz in the auditorium when a song leader walks up there to lead our first song, and we switch from all of the chaos and turmoil, all our conversation, to all of a sudden we're singing praises to God just that quick. Are we really in the right frame of mind in that kind of an atmosphere? I'm just asking. I'm not the judge in that matter for sure. But I think it's something that we need to give serious consideration to. I can remember a time in my lifetime when we assembled together to worship that people would come into the auditorium that either pull a songbook out of the rack and begin to read the words of a song or that open their Bibles up and they'd begin to read certain scriptures. Reverence. Silence, respect, awe in the presence of the Almighty. And now it is most difficult at times for the song leaders to get our attention to even get our worship started. Have we gone that far away from a holy respect for the God that we worship? Again, I say, I'm just asking. I think it's something we need to consider. Leviticus chapter 10, we have that in the outline. You probably thought we weren't going to get to that tonight. 
Leviticus chapter 10, they dabbed to buy here. What did they do? Offered strange fire. They offered something that God had not commanded. Incidentally, and I've mentioned this before, take your concordance sometimes and follow that word strange all the way through your Bible. You'll, strange, literally interpret, interpreted, simply means something that God has not authorized. And so they offered strange fire. God had not authorized it. That's why and this is one of the passages that we so often use when we talk about matters of worship, as we will in, in future lessons here, when we think about all of the innovations that men are now offering as a form of worship to God, things that are not authorized in the Scripture, and yet do we expect God to accept it? It seems that we do. But I think when we read and study the story of Nadab and Abihu, it doesn't take us long to realize that, that if we are offering to God something God has not authorized, He is not going to accept it. That worship is in vain. Then you think about Jeremiah 10. We alluded to this last uh, Sunday and Sunday night, in which Jeremiah said, O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his own steps. It's not a matter of what I like or don't like. And yet oftentimes when we get in religious discussions with those who differ with us in, in matters of worship and items of worship, etc., the bottom line is, well, we just like it. But what about God? Does He like it? That's the real question, isn't it? Has God authorized it? If He hasn't, He's not going to accept it. It doesn't matter how much I like it or how much all of us together like it. If God has not authorized it, He's not going to accept it. That's why it's so crucial for us to not take lightly our worship to God. But then the question <clears throat> Is God really the object of our worship? Now, I raise that question with the two subpoints in mind under that. When someone says, I didn't get anything out of worship, is God really the object of the worship of that individual? When we come together and we sing praises, to God, giving Him honor and glory and praise. And we study from God's holy and divine will what God wants of us. And we pray to God. And we partake of the Lord's Supper, which, which is a reminder to us on a weekly basis of the Lord's death till He comes again. And we give of our means, giving back to God, as we often say, a portion of that with which He has blessed us. Things that He has authorized for us to do in worship, we come and we go through those various acts of worship, and then we leave and we say, I didn't get anything out of that. Then what is the object of our worship? It's not God. It's not God. If, if what we do... When we do what God has said to do to worship Him, and we say we don't get anything out of it or it's the most boring thing I've set through, that's the other comment down here, then God is not the object of our worship. We've missed the point on what worship is. When we do what God has said to do to worship Him, and we get nothing out of that, it's boring to us, then we have totally missed what worship really is. I think that's why it is so crucial that periodically we go through studies like these on, on worship to remind us. And the next lesson uh, is so vital in that regard. As a matter of fact, I, I started to skip this lesson and go to that one tonight on, on the matter of preparation for worship from Psalm 50. I think that is a powerful psalm when you really understand what the psalmist is writing in that regard, preparation for worship. And so we need to think seriously about this matter of worship. Now, there's a series of questions in the introduction there, point E, important questions relative to our worship. Do we go to worship to be entertained? Well, that's not why we should go, but is it why we go sometimes?
I think I've known some preachers who thought that was the purpose of worship. Because when they get in the pulpit, that's about all they try to do is entertain. They don't do a lot of gospel preaching. We're there to study God's Word, folks. We're there to learn more what God wants of us so we can be closer to God and ultimately be with Him when this life is over. And if I, as the speaker, become the focal point of that process, then I've taken God out of the picture. What is that saying that we sometimes use? Uh, I hear, hear people say it relative to preachers when they're praying sometimes, pray that they'll stand behind the cross. And Well, that, that's a good thought. And that's where preachers need to be, behind the cross. Preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so it's not a time of entertainment. Do we go to worship to be spectators? Well, if we don't participate in the worship, then, then why are we there? Do we go to worship to, to see a performance? To whom do we offer our spiritual sacrifices? To whom do we lift up our praise? Is our worship to be man-centered or God-centered? We see, that's the real basis of it all, isn't it? When our worship is geared to what we like and what we don't like, instead of what God has specified that He wants, then our worship has become man-centered. What is worship? In general, and I don't think this particular part is in your outline, but in general, inherent in the idea of worship is the idea of homage, adoration, reverence, praise given to God or to one. It doesn't have to be God. It could be vain worship given to somebody else. We give honor and glory and praise to somebody else. But as God is our object of worship, we praise Thee, O God, for the Son of our love. How can you sing that without being somewhat emotional, without being affected by it? Understanding what the God of heaven has done for us. I, you may remember this. I think it was in the very first lesson in our series that, that Cliff did for us. And he was talking about who the addressees were, if you remember that first lesson. They were children of God. And he mentioned 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1, in which John says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called sons of God. And he stopped and he said, Have you ever really pondered that? That the Creator of this world has chosen to adopt you and me as His children. How can you sing, we praise thee, O God, without being affected by it in some way? Worthy of praise is Christ our Redeemer. And on and on and on the list of songs could go wherein we do give honor and glory and praise to God in our song service. Maybe that's why the singing here is as great as it is. We Maybe we've got a lot of folks here that, that really do understand what's involved there, and we sing like it. It's what we ought to do. But this matter of worship, God is the object of our worship. In Exodus chapter 20, we're skipping a lot here because of, of time's sake, but in Exodus chapter 20, God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. See, we mentioned that a while ago. Who is this God that we're talking about? The same God that brought those people out of Egypt, crossed the Red Sea, so forth and so on. Then he says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. 
Thou shalt not bow down thyself. So there's worship. Bow yourself down to. Thou shalt not bow thyself down to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generations that hate me. And then he goes on, talk about not taking his name in vain and so forth. But he said, I'm the God that you're to bow down to. I'm the God that you're to honor and to praise and the one to whom you are to give glory, the one you are to worship. And he said, I'm a jealous God. And if we don't worship God, we worship some other God, then obviously we're going to be in serious trouble. What happened shortly after this? with the children of Israel, almost in connection with this very context. What? They, forgot they built a graven image, didn't they? They built that golden calf and said what about that golden You remember what they said about that golden calf? Huh? This is the God that brought us out of Egypt. Can you imagine how soon we forget who this God is. That's why I think that periodically we need to, to remind ourselves in that regard just, just who is this God and what He expects of us in our worship to Him. In Deuteronomy uh, chapter 8 and in verse uh, 19, And it shall be, if thou do it all, forget the Lord thy God, and walk after other gods, and serve them, and worship them, I testify against you this day that ye shall surely perish. You're going to perish. In other words, God said, I won't allow it. I won't put up with it. What happened to the nation of Israel whenever they turned and began to serve the gods in whose land they were dwelling? God would bring an enemy nation against them, whether it was the Canaanites or the Amorites or Ammonites or some other ite, group of ites, <laughs> and suppress them. And they would be under that suppression until they would turn again to God and call upon God, and then He'd send a deliverer known as, ju as a judge to deliver them out from under that oppression. Why? Because He'd already told them, if you turn and serve other gods, you're going to have my wrath on you. That's how God feels about it us serving some other God. And so we need to understand who this God is. We've raised the question in the outline and give several different answers. Why is God alone worthy of our worship? Well, first of all, He's the only true God. There are a lot of other false gods, but He's the only true God. Deuteronomy chapter 6, or rather, Deuteronomy, um, uh, Daniel chapter 2, I was skipping a little bit there. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 28. But there is a God in heaven. There is a God in heaven. Daniel made that statement to Nebuchadnezzar. Did Nebuchadnezzar ever understand anything about God? <laughs> when he was out grazing like the beast of the field, I think he understood a little something about God that he never had seen before. Idols are, are nothing. God alone is deity. Go back to, to 1 Kings chapter 18. Who is Baal? What is Baal? Compared to God, he's nothing. And he was a God that was given much, much respect in that regard as, as a God. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. He's the only one. He's not an option. He's the only object of our worship. We don't have any reason to worship anybody else in that regard. Malachi chapter 2. I don't know if I corrected it in your outline or not. I originally had chapter 4 in there. I believe it's Malachi chapter 2 and verse 10. Have we not all one Father? Hath not one God created us? Deuteronomy chapter 6. Thou shalt fear. There's the respect the Lord God and 
serve him. He's the only God. There is none other. He is holy. Second point there. Why is God alone worthy of our worship? He's holy. Psalm 99, Psalm 96, several verses in that regard. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at His holy hill for the Lord our God is holy. Psalm 99. Worship at His holy hill. Do you remember the occasion when God called Moses to lead Israel, go over back over into Egypt and lead those people out? How did God contact Moses? Wasn't through his cell phone, didn't text him, did he? Well, he did send him a text in a form of a burning bush and spoke to him out of it and said what? Take your shoes off. The ground whereon you stand is holy ground. Is that the way we feel when we come in the presence of God to worship Him? That we are, spiritually speaking, on holy ground? Now, there's nothing special about a building of brick or stone or wood in which we might worship. But whenever we assemble together to worship God, we come before Him do we come with the attitude, I'm on holy ground here. I'm in the presence of the Almighty in a very special way when I come to worship. And until we come to that sense of what worship is all about, I think it's going to be difficult for us to worship God in the way God desires to be worshipped. We've already mentioned Genesis 1. He's the Creator. He is love. He provides redemption. You know, the list of things could go on and on as to why God alone is the one worthy of our worship. So when we come together, when we assemble to worship God, let us remember what it's all about. Let us not be looking for something that God never intended worship to be. And when we worship in the way that He has specified we will not be able to say, I didn't get anything out of it. Well, that was one of the most boring things I've ever sat through. When you hear those kinds of statements made, you're listening to somebody who has little, if any, concept of what worship is if, in fact, that assembly has worshiped God as God specifies. You can't leave with that idea. All right, it's time for the second bell, so we will just stand up.